welcome to Forum 360 for a Zoom edition of our Global Outlook with a Local View. I'm Leslie Unger, your host today. I believe there are a million bad things that COVID is responsible for, but there are also a few good things. Due to COVID, Forum 360 has now has the ability to do Zoom, and our guest today is a guest that we would never be able to have if it wasn't for the ability to Zoom. Mark Halpern is a national figure, former ABC News, Bloomberg, Showtime, a best-selling author, contributor, and a writer of a newsletter seven days a week. Anyone that has ever written a newsletter knows that seven days a week is quite an accomplishment. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest visiting Forum 360 today, a, a weekly guest on Sirius Radio, but our guest today. Welcome, Mark. Leslie, thank you. I, I'm pretty sure if you'd asked me to drive to Ohio pre-COVID, I would have. So <laughs> I'm challenge, challenging your initial premise, but very nice of you to invite me and very glad I could join you. Confess that I'm a political junkie. And I, I have come to the conclusion that embalming fluid may be the only cure. But I've also come to realize over the years that not everyone is interested in politics. Perhaps the last four years have changed that a little bit. We'll find out today. While I have as my guest today is an expert, whatever that means in today's national politics, my goal today is for all of us to learn some lessons from politics and from everyday life that we can apply to our professional life. So welcome viewers. and listeners. My guest and I have never met before. I once emailed him last fall to ask if he wanted my unsolicited advice about something, which he said he did. And that's the only contact we had. Until a few weeks ago, I assumed my place on the couch at about 8.04 p.m. And I emailed Mark and asked him to be a guest on Forum 360. At 8.12, he answered me, yes. Now, I want to start out with this question, Mark, because as an executive coach, I counsel clients to be responsive to emails. It's a way to protect your value. But you have to get emails from all over the country, if not the world. First of all, I have to ask you, how do you answer everyone's email? Uh, it takes a lot of time, but I think it's important to do. Uh, you know, I, I, one great thing about doing a newsletter with readers, mostly in the United States, but some all over the world, is I get to hear from lots of people. And particularly during COVID, when the basics of being a reporter, at least as far as I've been a reporter, which is traveling around and talking to people, it's just not been possible very much. Um, the chance to hear from people, uh, you know, you can learn a lot from questions. Sometimes people will email me with advice or, or, or information. A lot of my readers are people who are sources of mine who, who send me information. But just getting questions from readers uh, is a great, a great gift as far as I'm concerned professionally. And during the pandemic, it allows me to stay in touch with real people, which is nice. And so I've always believe that if you let your inbox grow too big, you'll never get it back down. I've had a little crisis late last year where mine grew to a very large number and uh, I spent six months getting it down. It's now almost manageable. So I try to answer very quickly and I'm a pretty fast Googler. So I got your request and I Googled about the program and about you and seemed like uh, a good opportunity to get a chance to talk to you and to others. So I'm, I'm happy to do it and happy to, um, happy to, as I always am, to engage with people who are interested in the world. So that was my next question was why? Because I'm thinking if you said yes to me, you know, you that means that you're pretty open. So what lesson is there, I guess, out there for people to say yes to opportunities that, you know, yeah. may be un, unexpected and, and you can't really know for sure? Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't recommend people say yes to everything. And I have a, a general rule about radio and television, which is I never go on a program I haven't seen or listened to. So I did a little quick a little quick viewing to see, but I mean, you know, if time allows and and someone someone is, you know, the way you asked was very gracious and you explained the program, you explained why you were asking. And so I think I think that time management in the digital age is extremely challenging, no matter who you are. Um, you know, I wonder how uh, 
you know, super important, super busy people manage their inboxes because uh, it's a challenge. But, you know, you're somebody like, you know, Ron Klain, the White House Chief of Staff, or Jared Kushner, who worked for his father-in-law in the White House, you know, they must get lots and lots of texts and emails and it's a big challenge to manage. But, um, but I think it's important to be responsive to people. And I think it's important to look for opportunities to do interesting things. And um, I consider this being on here with you, Leslie, to be an interesting thing. Thank you. 2020 taught us um, that in our professional lives, that we had to learn to be nimble. Um, my words for 2020 you know, were to be brand, to be energized, um, to be resilient. Um, you know, in your career, you've been a producer, an author, a journalist, a, a showtime, a contributor, a host. What is some advice that you have about recreating your professional self? Well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm just coming back from the first sort of extensive reporting trip I've done in a year uh, to CPAC in Florida. And I was reminded of uh, something I call the producer gene. Television producers are, um, who are good television producers, have the ability to get things done and the mentality that they're going to get something done. So you walk into a hotel and, and you've got, you need 10 rooms because you got a big family trip. And they say, oh, we lost a reservation. There are no rooms. And everybody's tired and wants to go to sleep. Someone with the producer gene has everybody in bed within 20 minutes. They just do. And so whether I've been a host or an anchor or a reporter or a writer or a producer, uh, once I develop that producer gene pretty early in my career, I go into any situation confident that I can get us those 10 rooms. And I think that applies to almost any career because I have friends who do lots of different things, whether you're a lawyer, an accountant, a bus driver, um, a farmer having that producer gene, which is again, just the mentality that says, I will get this done and I will do it nicely. I'm not gonna steamroll people or yell at people or trick people. I will be nice, I will be firm, I will be creative and I will get things done. And so throughout my career, whenever I've done something new, I've employed that producer gene. Now, in one of your newsletters, you talked about something that I had not heard talked about in probably decades, um, way before cell phones. When I was first starting out, I was in sales. You know, I was taught if you wanted to get a hold of the owner of the company, either call early in the day or call late in the day. Right. And you were talking about how you would spoke to someone very new in the position in, in the Biden administration that you had simply called early. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's advice that, that stays consistent, but, you know, do you remember that story and what someone could, could glean from that? I do, although I have to say it was it was not a true story in that case. It's something I've done throughout my career, but in that case, it was it was a little joke. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with calling the president's national security advisor at six six in the morning, knowing that if he's there, he's probably going to pick up his own phone. Uh, if he doesn't want to pick up the phone, he doesn't have to. If he picks up, he doesn't want to talk. He can excuse himself. But but in general, again, that's that's the producer gene. That's creative. I want to talk to that person. If I tried to call them at 10 o'clock, um, you know, one thing I'll say um, as a professional matter for reporters, professional matters for others, and as a personal matter, I'm a big fan of the voice as opposed to texting and email. I do a lot of texting and email and communicating on social media. But I, I think I think one thing I tell young reporters is pick up the phone and call. And, and when we're not in a pandemic, go see people face to face. Young people, I find just it's not their default. Their default is digital, uh, you know, text communication or sending emojis or photos. Um, so I call people a lot and, um, and I find that to be, you know, more human and more helpful. And, um, and, uh, and again, I'll go back to the producer gene of just, of just saying, you're going to solve the problem. You're not going to admire the problem, bemoan the problem, describe it, examine it, uh, tell other people about it. You're just going to solve it. Now you, um, when I Googled you, um, your father was a foreign policy expert. Now I'm still curious, is. I still is. I live with a man who grew up in, a, in another country and that has affected how I look at both America and how the world looks at America. And I'm wondering if there was something that you can point to that it contributed to your view of either America or how the world looks at America. Uh -huh. what, what country? Uh, Tunisia, France, uh -huh. Israel, America. That's a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my father worked in the Johnson Pentagon, John, Lyndon Johnson Pentagon, and then in the Nixon White House. 
and he traveled quite a bit uh, for work and dealt with a lot of global issues and had a particular focus for time on Japan. And Japan has been, been one of my great personal and professional interests is why I've been there a lot. And, and I'm very interested in their culture. And that prism, um, I could give you a lot of answers to the question, but, but this is what I'm giving you. That prism has been incredibly helpful to me because Japan it, during my lifetime, uh, most of my lifetime and my adult life has been you know, one of the leading industrialized democracies in the world and a, and a vibrant economy, vibrant democracy, um, uh, a leader internationally on in things. The United States has been a leader in, in culture and technology and architecture. And, um, and yet it couldn't be more different than the United States in a lot of ways. So when I studied uh, Japan uh, in college, their governmental system is very different than the United States, very different. They have a parliamentary system, but what I quickly learned, thanks to my one of my professors, is their system politically is actually more like the other industrialized democracies in the U.S. So Japan has been a great prism for me to see the way the United States is atypical in some ways, more typical in others. And, and to have a country like Japan, whose economy and cultural influence is so similar and yet is in so many ways different, has been a real benefit to me to, to, to kind of keep my perspective about the U.S.'s place in the world. Now, before we get to the current day, um, you went to Harvard. What is something that would surprise us about going to Harvard? Um, I don't know, because people are pretty knowledgeable about everything these days. So whenever I'm asked what would surprise, I always hesitate. I think it's the case, at least when I was there, that if you go there and you don't want to be a very academic person, you don't have to be a very academic person and you can still graduate. Um, I, I, I'm a very bad student. Uh, I just, I get sleepy when I read and I'm not very disciplined uh, and I'm not great at taking tests. So, uh, I although I think I could do graduate. better now. I still graduate. So my point okay. is there, there's some places where it's some, some competitive schools where I think there's more pressure to be academically oriented once you get in. There really isn't at Harvard. Once you're in, it's kind of like, um, I wouldn't say easy, but you can make it relatively easy academically. And that's a, the way a lot of elite Japanese universities are. It's hard to get into elite Japanese university, but once you get in, I, I, my understanding is it's, you, you know, you don't have to work all that hard as compared to getting in and uh, the process to get in. And, and that's, that's what Harvard can be like if that's what one chooses. Now that is a surprise. Okay, there you go. Now, Reese, you just, th this show will air in a few weeks, but I, I'm asking this question because it, you, this past weekend, may have repercussions for the next two or four years. You were just at CPAC. Mm -hmm. um, you have written about being at CPAC when Trump first spoke to CPAC and, and how you felt about seeing him first speak and, and the effect that he may have in the future. So mm -hmm. my first question is, did you hear anyone at CPAC that you felt is going to have a big effect in the next two to four years? Um. Yeah, I mean, I could name a lot of people because I listen to a lot of people. And I talk to a lot of people there, but um, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, the governor of South Dakota, Kristi Noem, and someone who I've talked to in the past, uh, Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas. I think all three of them have the potential to be the Republican nominee in 2024 and to be big players in, in at least within the conservative movement uh, and the Republican Party, if not, if not, now, if not more broadly. But I'd say those three are, are three people I talked to who I, I would definitely keep keep your eye on. When I watch journalists on, now on TV, um, mm -hmm. I think of say Maggie Haberman. I wonder when you were a journalist, did you think you were going to be making a living or partly making a living on a visual medium like TV, or did you see yourself just as a print journalist that would just be doing the writing but wouldn't be out front? Well, my first job was in television. Um, and most of my career, I've been in television. I was at Time Magazine for a while, but even when I was at Time, I did a lot of television. I didn't start doing uh, on-air work until a little bit when I was covering Bill Clinton in 1991. Um, and then, uh, let's see, by 19, by 2000, I was doing a lot of on-air work. So 12 years into my career, I shifted to a role that was kind of 50-50 on-air and behind the scenes. And then um, in around uh, 2008, I shifted to primarily being, you know, having a byline in Time Magazine and, and being in front of the camera. So um, I've never given up though, being a producer. And I think, I think one piece that, of advice. Producer Gene. Yeah, the producer Gene. And 
one piece of advice I give people who work in anything that's collaborative and most, most jobs are most civic activities, volunteer work is, is try to figure out how everyone else does their job. What's hard about their job? What's fun about their job? Uh, how did they learn to do their job? Because the more you understand what other people are doing, the easier it is to appreciate their work and the easier it is to get the most out of the collaborative effort. You know, put a, a taped piece of television on the air, um, you know, on a network is, you know, 150 people literally could touch that in one way or the other from the graphics to the bookings, to the, to the editing, to the shooting. If you know a lot about how everybody works, you can get the most out of it. You can minimize the dangers and the risks and you can maximize the creative opportunities. So, so even as I've become, uh, even as I became someone who was on camera hosting shows, I, I thought a lot about oh, how do they make that graphic? How do they get that piece of video? Who's booking the satellite time? All of those things, um, uh, I think, I think if, I've, if, I've, if I've had one advantage or two advantages of the two advantages, I think that have allowed me to, to have some success in my career. One of the two is, always appreciated and learned about what other people how other people do their jobs and like I said I think that's that's he, he, applicable to almost any other profession I think I, yes I, I think that it is now before we turn to today's politics um, mm -hmm. I want to introduce reintroduce our guest today Mark Halpern he is currently author of the seven day week wide world of news and contributed to other sources on today's politics so first, let me ask you this. I hear educated people say all the time, I don't watch the news. I don't watch any of the politics. I don't turn on the TV. I don't read anything. Why should the quote average, there is such a thing, average American care about the daily goings on in our capital? Well, you know, you've talked about politics now using that phrase a couple of times. I think that for me, Politics is not who's someone hiring as their campaign manager or when's this committee going to pass this bill. To me, politics is the aspirations of the country. What, in, in terms of, case of America, what are the aspirations of the American people? And in both politics and government, if they're being done correctly and if they're being covered by journalists correctly, it's it's that's the prism through which to look at that. So there are lots of people who care about who you know who who's Joe Biden's campaign manager going to be or who's his secretary of defense going to be. I care about that stuff some, but not nearly as much as a lot of political reporters. I care about, you know, what, are the, what does the country want in a defense secretary? What does the country want to spend on, on the Pentagon? Um, so I think, I think I, I don't blame people for not being interested in, in the, you know, the nuts and bolts and kind of the, the soap opera aspects of it. Some people are, some aren't, but I think what everybody should be interested in is what does what the government doing, what is, what is what political candidates are saying, how does that potentially affect the real lives of real people? And if that's how you think of it, if that's how it's covered, then I think who wouldn't be interested in that because the government's the biggest part of our economy. It's the biggest uh, expression of our national aspirations, our national hopes and fears, and tells you, you know, can you send your kid to college? Can you afford to buy a house? Uh, can you get a raise um, uh, if, if you're making the minimum wage? Can um, you be safe when you take a flight overseas? All those things are, you know, those are important to everybody. One thing that's, that has really come up the last week or so for me, and, and I'd like you to weigh in on this. Today, when people vote for a candidate, whether it's a, a mayor, a governor, a senator, a congressman, yeah. a president, and I know it's not fair generalization. No, no generalization is true for this one, but um, do they vote more on issues, you know, I'm pro-choice, I'm, I'm pro-life. Where does character come in? Do people vote for character and leadership anymore? I think they do. I mean, I think that character and leadership have become part of another word that I think is a broader word that, that people really care about, which is authenticity. Um, so there are a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump twice who at least the second time, and in many cases, the first time said, you know, I don't really care much for the guy's character, but they saw him as authentic and they saw him as an authentic expression of the way they wanted the president to be. They didn't want an insider. They wanted an outsider. They didn't want someone who would kind of pay attention to the, the norms of, of how people treat each other in government. They wanted someone who'd be different. So, so character is part of authenticity. 
I think values is part of authenticity, but authenticity is kind of the expression of who someone is. And, 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 and I think people want authenticity to have a, a, now, you have a, which word, is, a word for 2021, kind of an effort. I gave it about an hour try and I got to tell you, I gave up. You have the word grace, your gang of grace. I think it sounds great, but I don't know how to do it. I don't know how when someone says the election was stolen, when a senator says, you know, it wasn't an armed insurrection. I didn't see arms. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that with grace. So would you talk yeah. about your idea um, and your initiative of a gang of grace? Yeah, and, a, you know, gang of grace and presumption of grace as opposed to a presumption of hate. I just, you know, I felt this way since the 90s uh, when when I saw so much hatred in politics and in the country more broadly. Um, I think that it's easy to show grace towards someone you agree with. It's hard to show someone you disagree with. And, you know, the things you cited, uh, claiming the election was stolen, nitpicking, saying, well, the Capitol might have been invaded, but, you know, people people were looted in Minneapolis. You know, but I would tell you, that people who have different politics than you do have the same, you know, mirror image issues. So I was watching some cable news today on my flight and they were talking about the new vaccine and they were covering the development of the new vaccine and the Biden administration's role in its distribution like it was a celebration. They weren't saying, well, I wonder if this one works or how much is Johnson and Johnson making off of this? Or did the Biden administration really play a big role here? Now, you think back to last year, how was developments related to the vaccine covered by liberal cable channels? Not like that, not like a celebration. When President Trump said the vaccine could be available by the end of the year, the press didn't say, well, that would be great. Let's, let's write glowing pieces about the people in the Trump administration who developed that. So can you show grace towards the reporters who covered the development of the vaccine last year differently than they're covering it this year? If you're, if you're someone on the right, it's hard for them. They look at that and they're furious to say, how unfair. So you have people that you have difficulty showing it to, but I can tell you the people who, people who say um, uh, the capital, you know, the, the things, the examples you gave that the election was stolen, they've got problems too with people. So what I'm advocating through the presumption of grace, not the presumption of hate is, I give everybody one or two passes and a lot of people will use their pass for Donald Trump and other people on the left. But I think with few exceptions, it's important to extend some of the presumption of grace, reason with them, talk to them about their ideas, try to convince them that they're right or that they're wrong if you disagree with them. But just the basics of not hating them, not approaching them in a way that where they're a cartoon or a caricature, even if, I mean, pretty, you know, the things you just said, I won't say all 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump will agree, but let's say 30 million. I think that I feel safe with that number being a floor. You want to disagree with 30 million Americans and, and not afford them the presumption of grace? I just I just think as a country, we just can't afford that. So I'm trying to get everybody to start in their political dialogue and their in their discussions with friends and family, where some people have trouble extending the presumption of grace. Let's start with a presumption of grace. Let's start by treating people like human beings. Let's start without uh, anger, animus, um, criticism. And then let's then let's you know let's let's do what we need to do to get the country headed in the right direction. It doesn't cost a single tax dollar, and as I've been able to do it more and more, I'm not perfect, but as I've been able to do it more and more, as I've been trying to practice what I'm preaching now, it feels great. It just it's a it's a huge relief to not be angry at people and to really just extend the presumption of grace, look at it from their point of view as best you can, and try to engage in a dialogue that can maybe change hearts and minds and brains. Uh, as opposed to just constantly clench fists at each other. I'm going to ask you for a, a kind of a yes or no answer to this question. Frank Luntz, in one of his you know polling, said that over 50% think America's best days are behind us. You mm -hmm. talk to the Redlands and the Blue Lands. Um, yes or no? Would you say that that the Redlands and the Blue Lands? Do they say that the, our best days are behind us? Well, increasing number of Americans have said that. I mean, another way to ask the question is, do you think your children and grandchildren will have a better America or more economic opportunity, better country than you've had? And an increasing number of Americans have said no. I think that's one of the, one of the most um, corrosive and discouraging statistics in polling. 
you know, it's a, it's kind of a longer term version of, do you think the country's on the right track or the wrong track? People have said wrong track and very high numbers for quite some time with few exceptions. So I think it's important that this country, which was founded on optimism, which is throughout its history has had lots of optimistic people who have, who have led the way to succeed as not just economically, but culturally and in terms of society and religion and faith. I think it'd be great to get to a place where people could be more optimistic, but I think to go back to the presumption of grace, I think part of why people are pessimistic is because they feel so divided. They feel like we're having, you know, the second civil war, uh, not usually violent, but sometimes with violence, but just a day to day um, uh, clash between the red lens and the blue lens that, you know, I could see when people are pessimistic about that, it makes me a little pessimistic, but I'm hoping we can rise above it. I want to end on something optimistic. Where is the first place you want to get on a plane and go post COVID? One place. Uh, back to Tokyo with my family. Back to Tokyo. But that's, but that's almost always my answer because I love it there. Thank you to Mark Halpern and our audience for joining us today. If you remember one thing from our discussion, perhaps you will remember to answer your emails, to answer <laughs> quickly, and to show grace. I'm Leslie Unger, your host on Forum 360. Thank you to Mark Halpern and our audience for joining us today. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.